slides. All right, is that looking all right? Yes, looking great. So take it away. Perfect. All right. So thanks so much for the invitation to this fantastic conference series or seminar series. So today I'll be talking about a really interesting mechanism that bacteria use to protect their chromosome integrity during stress. Here we go. So I think it's fascinating how dynamic the organization is of bacterial chromosomes under different environmental conditions. But here I'm showing you some you know, seminal work from the Ishihama lab where here we're looking at under two different growth conditions, what are the different proteins that organize the E. coli nucleoid and what's their you know, relative abundances. And you can see that if we're comparing yeah, you know, E. coli bacteria that are rapidly growing, so exponential phase, versus E. coli that have been starved for uh, 48 hours, that everything is totally different, right? Like the DBS protein is just a minor component of the nucleoid in rapidly growing, you know, healthy cells. But on these starved cells, DBS explodes in concentration and becomes by far the most abundant protein that organizes the nucleoid during the stress condition. So we don't just see that there is a change in the relative concentrations of these nucleoid organizing proteins during stress. There's also a major change in the organization of, you know, like the structure of the nucleoid. So here I'm showing you some amazing images from the Minsky lab, where here he's looking at E. coli cells that have been starved for 48 hours. He takes thin sections of them and we're looking at them under cryo-EM. And we see this electron dense area in the middle of the bacterium. And in the bottom image, when we zoom in, we see that the nucleoid is compacted into this highly organized region where there's regular spacing of this highly compacted repeating bundle of something, <laughs> right? So what people have seen is that each little dot in these EM images we can see is a DPS oligomer. Uh, so we're seeing DPS is in this basically crystallized format in these stressed E. coli cells. And what makes this a great system for biophysicists or biochemists to study is that these so-called biocrystals, these DPS DNA complexes, have the same structure, as far as we can tell, both in vivo and in vitro. So people have done crystal structures in vitro, shown in the bottom here, of purified DPS with purified DNA. If you look at the crystal packing and symmetry and geometry of these complexes, it's exactly the same as on the top here, what you see inside living cells. So this is like a fantastic system, right? So it's basically a two component system, you know, to a first order of uh, estimation, only DPS and DNA coming together to form this apparently crystalline structure inside living cells. So this is where you know, we're starting to talk, the talk today is with this background information. So when we look at these incredible images of these you know, crystalline-like structures inside living bacteria, you know, one question we had is, so what we think we're seeing here is the electron-dense DPS oligomers, but we don't know where the chromosome is, where is the DNA, right? So do these DPS biocrystals indicate that the chromosome itself, the DNA, is actually also compacted in vivo? So to look at this, we had a great bachelor student, uh, Zayida Ravai. She was looking at either wild-type E. coli cells or E. coli deleted from missing DPS. She stained the chromosome only with a Herx stain and did some fluorescence microscopy. And after a nice bit of analysis, here's the data that we see. We see that if we compare the nuclear length of the fraction of total cell length, in here we're looking at E. coli cells either starved for 24 or 96 hours. If you compare this feature for both wild type bacteria or bacteria missing DPS, you see that having DPS leads to a 25% in the 24 hour or a 33% compaction in the relative nucleoid length, which is massive, right? So 33% compaction is a lot. So I think we're safe here saying that DPS does in fact Compact the nucleate of starved cells. Okay, so now that that question solved, uh, you know, hopefully for now. Uh, another question, which I thought was much more kind of interesting, 
presented itself, which is, you know, what is the effect of this massive compaction of the chromosome on various activities taking place on the DNA? So can your RNA polymerase holoenzyme actually interact with this, you know, quasi-crystalline DNA, you know, kind of diffuse through, find a start site, and then elongate and make an RNA transcript? Because I'm looking at the crystal compaction, there shouldn't be enough room for an RNA polymerase holoenzyme to, you know, wiggle its way through this crazy biocrystal. All right, so first we looked at this question in vivo. So we have this fantastic grad student, Mattia Ahrens, who did full transcriptome analysis, so RNA-seq analysis. Uh, we have the same two bacteria strains, so wild type E. coli and DPS knockout strains. She took these two strains, starved them, extracted their RNA, reverse transcribed as cDNA, and then used high throughput sequencing to look at, you know, what's the abundance of all of the different transcripts in these bacteria. So here's one of our results that we saw. Here we're looking at RNA, mRNA from 24-hour star E. coli. We're looking at, so each dot here is an individual mRNA species, so one type of mRNA. We're comparing its abundance in wild type on the y-axis versus DPS knockout cells on the x-axis. All right, so if it is the case that knocking out DPS has uh, no effect on transcription rates of a specific gene, then like the dot for that gene should be on this diagonal line, like the y equals x line. And that is exactly what we see for every single gene <laughs> in E. coli. So there's like 4,400 dots on this graph. They're all on this y equals x line, except that one gene was significantly differently transcribed. That's the DPS gene way over there on the side, which is of course, you know, knocked out in the knockout stream. So we were incredibly surprised to see that DPS had no measurable effect on transcription in starved E. coli cells. Because, you know, in, as far as I know, every other biological experimental system that people have looked at before, compaction of DNA is like the seminal way that organisms can change transcriptional activity of, you know, the compacted or condensed DNA. So that was really weird <laughs> that we saw this result. Uh, you know, we wondered, does this lack of change in the transcriptome imply that there is similarly no change in the proteome, in the relative abundances of proteins? So we did like a very analogous experiment we used mass spectrometry, uh, mass spectrometry techniques uh, called SILAC to look at the relative abundance of proteins in our wild type and our DPS knockout strain. Again, each dot is an individual protein. We see like slightly more scatter here than we saw in our RNA-seq experiment. But you know, if you look by Q values, we can be really confident that three proteins are differently abundant when there's uh, DPS versus not. And by, Q, by P value, there's you know, a few more. So what we can see is this massive change in the organization and the condensation of DNA in starved bacteria has no measurable effect on the transcriptome and really mild effect on the proteome. So mechanistically, you know, molecular detail, does this mean that RNA polymerase, this massive complex, can actually really diffuse through this compacted DNA, find its star site and start transcription with no effect. So we wanted to look at this, you know, in more mechanistic detail, so we did some biochemical experiments. So first we're looking at the initiation rate of RNA polymerase. So we have a couple of really well characterized kind of canonical transcription start sites, promoters from bacteria. We have, you know, like some very short pieces of DNA, I'm showing you the sequences here, that we have in vitro. We'll put them in a test tube. We'll either add DBS to compact them or not. Then after we let our complexes form, we add RNA polymerase. We add like the shortest possible little primer that we can, which is a two base pair primer. We add GDP, which is the next base pair in the transcript, you know, for whichever transcript we're looking at. And then we look to see, you know, how much initiation activity can we see. Uh, so here we're looking at is the relative levels of RNA produced when we had or did not have DPS present. And we see no significant difference in amount of you know, initiation that we see in any of these conditions. 
So that means that when our DNA templates are compacted and you know, quasi-crystallized by DPS, our nucleomerase is still able to diffuse through, find a start site, and initiate the process of transcription. Okay, so what about elongation of transcription? Uh, so to look at transcriptional elongation, we did a biophysical assay. It's exciting for this audience, I hope. So we used a magnetic tweezer setup. These work, this work was done by um, Richard Jansen and Natalia Vidarina from TU Delt, where we used to work. This is a single molecule assay. So here we're looking at a single piece of DNA. It's tethered to a substrate on one end and free on the other end. This piece of DNA, it's got one single start site and one single open reading frame that can be transcribed. We flow on RNA polymerase. So a single RNA polymerase uh, begins transcription and we stall it out in the middle of transcribing a transcript. This RNA polymerase is tethered to a magnetic bead. So via our magnetic tweezer setup at any given moment, we can tell how far RNA polymerase has traveled along its template DNA strand during the course of the experiment. So at this point, we can either choose to flow on DPS or not. If you flow on DPS, we know from you know, a lot of previous other experiments that we have enough DPS that the downstream DNA is totally compacted. So if the RNA polymerase is gonna make a transcript, it's gotta kind of bulldoze its way through this you know, biocrystallized DNA. Then we you know, flow on the nucleotides and watch to see what happens during transcription. All right, so here is the result of one of our sets of experiments. Here we're displaying our data as a range of probability densities over a range of dwell times. So what does that mean? That means that uh, on the kind of left-hand chunk of the graph, what we see is that it's very likely that we see polymerases that are moving very fast, that have short dwell times. So that's kind of rapid elongation. Uh, if you're looking here in the black curve. Uh, in the middle chunk, that's the short pause segment. So we see it's less likely for polymerases to undergo short pauses, you know, one to five seconds in duration. And on the right hand chunk of the graph, we see that it's even less likely that we see RNA polymerase molecules that are undergoing long pauses, so five seconds or more. And so if we compare the black and the red lines, once again, there is no significant difference between the situations. So even if the RNA polymerase is transcribing through this crystallized DNA, the velocity of elongation is not affected, and there is the exact same probability that your polymerase will be undergoing a short or long-lived paused state. So there's just no effect on anything <laughs> related to transcription that we can detect with any of our assays, either in vivo or in vitro. All right, so is this just some funky thing about RNA polymerase? Or is it you know, something more broad about transcriptional regulators? So you know, the fact that our RNA-seq indicated that the transcriptome is not affected would suggest that other transcriptional regulators might also be able to affect this condensed DNA. So when we look back and we peeked at our kind of model DNA substrates, we saw that <clears throat> one of them that we were using for our initiation assay had a binding site for LEX-A, which is a bacterial transcriptional repressor. So we were lucky enough to beg some Lexa from a collaborator and we set up our experiment where we took our DNA template, uh, we incubated it with DPS to compact it or not, we added Lexa so that could bind or not bind if it was able to bind, then we add RNA polymerase and all the goodies so that RNA polymerase is able to do a full transcriptional reaction. And on the graph down here, what we see in the gray boxes is you know as we go from zero to 20 to 100 nanomolar of let's say as we have more and more of our repressor we see less and less transcriptional activity so our lex a is working like an active lex a and in blue we can see that when we add enough dps to fully compact our dna templates here we don't see any effect on lex a's ability to repress the transcriptional activity so lex a seems to have full ability to repress transcription in this crystallized DNA. And this is true whether our RNA polymerase whole enzyme contains the sigma 70 or the sigma S stigma factor. So yeah, so at least like three proteins seem to be able to access our DNA just fine, even if it's crystallized. So this Lexa repressor and the two different flavors of RNA polymerase. 
right? So maybe this is just like a universal property of proteins. Maybe every protein can access this DPS, DPS condensed DNA. Um, so going back one more time to look at our DNA templates, and we were able to identify in each of these templates we were working with a unique restriction enzyme cut site, you know, for each of these templates. So we wanted to ask, how are restriction enzymes able to access this DNA when it's condensed by DPS? So we took our templates, condensed them with, DNA, with DPS, added the restriction enzyme, and looked to see could they cut the template or not when the DNA was compacted. And we finally see a positive result. I'm so excited. So what we see is that, um, so each of the templates is a different color here. For each template, as we add more and more DPS to the reaction, we see more and more protection from being cut. So protection you know, means it's not cut by the enzyme. And very interestingly, for each of these templates, we have measured the KD, you know, the uh, affinity for binding to DPS, and these affinities are labeled by the kind of vertical dotted lines on the graph. And we can see that as we're adding DPS, right when you get to the KD, more or less, is when you start to see the really full protection from being cut by the restriction enzymes. So this says that, um, you know, really when the DNA is compacted, that's when we start to see the enzyme activity being, uh, you know, not happening anymore. <laughs> you start to see less of the activity happening. So that was a really interesting series of experiments that we did. So what we saw was that when DPS, you know, performs this really dramatic compaction of DNA, we see that this compacted DNA can be fully accessed by the transcriptional machinery, both in vivo with our RNA-seq experiments and in vitro with our initiation and our elongation experiments for looking at transcription. All right, so why does the cell even bother, right? So why would the cell, with undergoing stress, bother to make tons of this DPS protein, totally rearrange its chromosome structure if there's not gonna be any effect on transcription? Uh, great question, everyone. So, uh, you know, what we've seen, what other groups have seen, is that DPS is not only this DNA binding, like nucleated organizing protein, it's also a stress response enzyme. And what we've seen is that, again, both in vitro and in vivo, when DPS is present, DNA is physically protected. So it's much less likely to be either broken by double-stranded breaks or mutated in various types of mutations by such, stressor, such stressors as, you know, radiation or reactive oxygen species or things like that, right? So this is a really interesting mechanism where we hypothesize that bacteria are able to provide physical protection of their genome while still allowing kind of the famous bacterial stress responses, you know, full transcriptional response to help them combat the stress enzymatically. And so, you know, the other interesting thing we saw was that the access of protein to condensed DNA is selective. So we saw, you know, a small number of transcriptional machinery proteins have full access to DNA, but three different kinds of restriction enzymes did not have access to our DPS condensed DNA. What's the meaning of that? <laughs> well, one thing we can say is that this is at least consistent with the behavior of phase separated systems, which is you know, very popular now in lots of different biological systems. Um, so we're certainly looking into whether this is the case. I can say that if this is a phase separation of the bacterial nucleoid, this would be, you know, one of the first examples in this kind of emerging field of bacterial phase separation. And I find it a really interesting one because a lot of the systems people are looking at, they're looking at liquid-liquid phase separation, whereas this could potentially be a case of liquid-liquid crystal phase separation, which sounds really interesting to me. And let me pull up my kind of jokey joke here. Um, you know, bacteria are famous for not having a nucleus, right? Um, but under stress, if they're able to phase separate out their nucleoid, this could be an interesting way where bacteria could potentially have all the benefits of a nucleus. So they can have, you know, selective access to the chromosome while not having the deleterious, you know, side effects of they don't have to waste all their energy spend all their energy by making a membrane and maintaining it. So this is kind of where we stood uh, summer before last, I guess, when we published our paper on this. 
Uh, since then, I'm going to show you a couple of new experiments that we've done since I moved my lab to the University of Rochester across the ocean from Stu Delts, where I used to work. And we've been doing some, I think, really interesting new biochemical, biophysical experiments to look more deeply at this system. So, you know, I mentioned the idea, could these DPS condensed DNA molecules, could this be an example of liquid crystalline complexes, right? So if we see these liquid crystalline complexes, we would want them to display an ordered structure, kind of representative of like, you know, similar to that you see in solids, but we'd also like to see liquid-like behavior, right? You know, that would be something that would allow maybe diffusion to happen of these massive RNA polymerase molecules through the liquid crystal. So to start to look at this, Here's some experiments that we've done. So Elio Bananzeri, a uh, senior scientist in my lab, did some experiments where they took purified DPS, some purified lambda DNA that was stained with Cytox orange. We've shown previously that Cytox orange does not have an effect on the affinity of interaction between DPS and DNA. He made complexes that were as massive as possible in vitro, and then he went to go image them under our confocal microscope. And when we look at our complexes, you know, at different depths, I'm going to show you what that looks like. Um, I don't mean to interrupt, but you have about three minutes. Thank you. Uh, here we go. All right, so we're going to kind of step our way through this complex. All right. So that is our crazy kind of squid-like looking complex. So there's a couple of things that I can note from what we see here. So on the one hand, we don't see a droplet, right? It's clearly not a droplet. So if it was a liquid liquid free separated system, you would expect your complex to be minimizing its surface area with which it interacts with the aqueous surrounding solution. We clearly don't see that. Um, instead, what I can you know, think I see is that we see some kind of internal structure, some kind of like sponge-like repeating internal structure, which you know, would be indicative of solid-like behaviors. All right, so this is kind of how the structures look in vitro. We want to also probe their mechanical behaviors. Can I advance my slide or not? Here we go. Uh, all right, so here we did some really interesting experiments on the Lumix system, and if Irvin Fry is still here, thank you for developing this system. So what Elio did was he made some of these massive complexes. Uh, he took some beads that were covered in very short DNA pieces and basically went fishing to try to like hook one of these complexes, you know, to be uh, anchored on a bead on either side. These bees are trapped in some twin optical traps, and we can use these traps to either, very technically speaking, stretch or stretch or squish the, con the complexes and measure their mechanical response. And in case you're interested, here's what this looks like before we get started on our experiment. We've stained the DNA so you can see our massive complex, and Elgo just drew in the beads so you can see more or less where they are before we start our experiment. Uh, so for one of these experiments, I'm showing the data here. Elio went, uh, underwent a round of stretching and squishing and stretching and squishing. Uh, this is for the extension profile. And when we see the force trace, uh, it doesn't look exactly the same as the extension profile, right? So we see after we squish, the complex relaxes. After we stretch, it relaxes again, right? So the fact that we see this kind of relaxation after mechanical perturbation indicates that our complexes also display some behaviors that are liquid-like. So just to totally wrap up this part of the talk, which is, you know, all the parts of the talk, um, when we're looking at, you know, what are the kind of mechanical structures, the physical structures of our DNA DPS complexes that we see, we don't see a droplet, we see something that has internal structures reminiscent of solids, but they also display liquid-like relaxations. So this is consistent with the idea that maybe we are forming these liquid crystal-like structures inside living cells, which sounds so interesting. And I'm really excited to keep looking more at these structures in the future. Uh, just one last thought before I leave this talk. Uh, what I talked about today is just a tiny part of what my lab works on. We also have a massive part of the lab that is kind of looking more in an applied direction. So we're looking to see, can we use bacteria to make materials in a way that Hopefully we can make a method that's really cheap and easy and environmentally friendly, but at the same time produce materials that are high quality, valuable materials. So uh, a little snapshot here, we're making 
structural materials inspired by seashells. We developed our own 3D printers that maybe Sue would be interested in using in the future. And we can use our 3D printers to print bacteria and create engineered biofilms. We have used bacteria to make graphene materials that are conductive. We're just starting some projects where we're making bioglass with bacteria, which hopefully we can use to make the world's tiniest micro lenses and biological lasers. And we're also um, hopefully about to publish soon a work where we can show that we can use bacteria and use it to mine conductive or magnetic materials out of regoliths, so Mars or Moon regoliths, to make uh, the structural and conductive materials on the Moon or in Mars. So I'd like to thank everyone involved with this work that I showed today. Um, and just a quick plug, we're currently hiring a PhD student because uh, one of the hosts of the seminar series and I, last week, were awarded an SF grant to continue work on this DPS project. So I'm hiring a PhD student. Mo, I believe, is hiring a postdoc, if I'm not mistaken. And we'd love to talk to people who are interested to work more on this project. And thanks very much. Thank you, Anne, for a wonderful talk. So once again, we are going to take a subset of questions from the chat box now and then more during the 15 minute uh, uh, Q&A extra time. So the first question I have for you is from uh, Gabriel Abraham. If, sorry if I butchered your name. So uh, the, the question is, has there been any work looking into how DNA and DPS interact? Is it just electrostatic or something else? This is interesting. So my group saw that there's three lysines that we can delete in the DPS unstructured and terminal region. And any one of these lysines, if we replace them with alanine, then the binding affinity is weakened by like a 10 to 30 fold, which to me suggests that it's primarily electrostatic interactions. Okay, so then the next question we have for you is from Phoebe Rice, and she asks, how does DPA affect transcription translation coupling? Oh, that is an interesting question. Um, uh, I mean, all I can say is that not only do we not see a change in the relative abundance of either mRNA molecules or proteins, we also don't see any change in the overall amount of mRNA or protein that's present in cells that are either missing or have DPS present when they're stressed. So. It looks like nothing has changed. Oh, we've not looked mechanistically at you know, the actual coupling of these, you know, of these processes. Mm -hmm. And then we have a question from Sarah Lian, and she asks, just curious, have you checked the effect of DPS in DNA repair activity? Oh, no, we haven't done that. So we can certainly say that if you look at living cells and you stress them with reactive oxygen species or UV radiation or very stressors like that, we definitely see in other labs, in the colder lab, have seen, you know, less double strand breaks, less, um, you know, mutations, like single base pair mutations in the DNA. It's not clear what causes this, right? It's not clear if this is some sort of effect working together with the DNA repair mechanisms, or if it's preventing these from happening in the first place. So that would be a really interesting question to look at in the future. Mm -hmm. And I will take one more question now, and then we will go to more questions in a minute. So Sujit Dutta, uh, our first speaker, he asks, can the DPS DNA sponge-like structures be thought of as being similar to fractal colloidal aggregates? Um, I mean, they certainly could be. <laughs> All I can say is that we just started to look at these before we had to shut our lab down back in March. So, uh, you know, it's certainly true that in other systems and people that have been seeing these phase separated complexes that they kind of mature over time <laughs> and they can change a bit their structure and they can change a bit their mechanical properties. So I like to look a lot more closely at the structure and the mechanical properties as if they mature, <laughs> as they mature over time. So hopefully we'll have more information within a year from now. All right, thank you, Anne, again. So we are going to close this part of the, you know, Q&A. And then we will take more questions for both Sujit and Anne. You know, there were many more questions in the chat box. Plus all of you should also feel free to, you know, uh, unmute yourself and ask questions directly or raise a hand, in which case we will call you out.